Yes, it's a Kia. Yes, you might want one. And no, this Gran Turismo model isn't merely a copy of something German. Welcome to the Kia Stinger. The looks don't lie. Did you ever imagine that one day Kia would bring you something like this? Well, the company itself did. What we have here is a so-called Gran Turismo, the Stinger, the first of quite a number of more upmarket premium models that the brand plans to bring you. It's quite something, isn't it? But if this car seems like a bolt from the blue, think again. Kia has been laying the groundwork for this Stinger for a long time, with this basic design first shown as a GT concept prototype at the Frankfurt Motor Show way back in 2011. Comes with quite a development pedigree too. The stylist, Frenchman Gregory Guillaume, was responsible for the jaw-dropping first-generation Audi TT. As for the guy who led development to this car's road dynamics, well, for those you can thank Albert Biermann, who until 2014 was head of BMW's M Performance division. Guillaume says his inspiration for this design lay in the Grand GT models he saw as a boy back in the early 70s as they rushed past bombing down the Autoroute du Soleil to the south of France, cars like the original Gijaro designed Maserati Ghibli. Now what that translates into today is a very interesting look indeed. The stylized five door hatch body shape closest in concept to sportier versions of mid-sized executive contenders like Audi's A5 Sportback and BMW's 4 Series Grand Coupe. Kia, not surprisingly, sees both these cars as close rivals, but also thinks that what's on offer here could appeal to people tempted by sleeker premium sports saloons in this segment, like Alfa Romeo's Giulia, Volkswagen's Artian, and Jaguar's XE. The Stinger is a fraction larger than models of that sort, as well as being more arresting to look at. It's also better equipped and it claims to be more dynamically focused, especially in the top 3.3 litre twin turbo V6 GTS flagship guys we'll be trying here. Well, we'll see. Like all variants in the range, this one sells at the kind of premium price point that'll be new to Europeans considering the Kia brand, although it'll be less shocking to customers elsewhere in the world. Those people are already used to moderately expensive Kia saloons that we don't see here, models like the K900 and the Cadenza, but even they haven't previously seen anything quite like this. Time to put this car to the test. Kia doesn't do things by halves. Now you know this the first time you set eyes on a Stinger and you're even more sure of the fact uh, the deeper you delve into the development history behind this car. It was certainly with models like this in mind that back in 2014 a fortune was paid to bring the former head of BMW's M Performance division, Albert Biermann, to come and develop the Korean maker's premium products. And the story is told the first time he set eyes on the prototype of this design. Right, he said, we we'll have to make sure this car drives the way it looks. Beerman and his team were clever enough to know that there was no point in trying to make some kind of tarmac tearing, track focused BMW M style model out of the Stinger. Apart from anything else, that's not what the uh, Gran Turismo concept that it's intended to epitomize is supposed to be all about. Uh, I think instead of this Kia being a kind of Porsche Panamera for the relatively well heeled common man, and you'll be closer to understanding the objective being targeted here. And this model was never intended tended to be the grippiest or the most agile choice in its class or the fastest, but the engineers did want it to be poised and engaging in a way that no previous Korean contender had ever been. Like the Panamera, it's a car in which you feel you could cross continents, uh, but also like that Porsche model, there's enough dynamic feedback here to keep you aware that much more than that is possible. So that, say, en route to Southern Europe, you could take in a lap or two of the Nürburgring Nordschleife on the way. That was a circuit where the majority of this car's ride and handling development was perfected. And that's something that you can really feel through this Stinger's impressively accomplished blend of high speed stability and crisp directional responsiveness. It's good enough to be considered alongside anything you could experience in a rival German premium brand model. 
But can the same be said about the engine wear on offer beneath the bonnet? After all, it's one thing fine-tuning ride and handling with poached expertise from other brands. It really is quite another to try to worry established European makers with powertrains that are either aging or which were originally developed for models with quite different priorities. Prior to trying the Stinger, we had worried for Kia on that score. After all, the engine that the majority of buyers in our market will probably choose, the 197bhp 2.2 litre CRDI diesel unit, is borrowed from Kia's resolutely unsporting Sorento SUV, and it's been used in that 4x4 since 2010. The alternative 2 litre TGDI petrol unit is a 244bhp power plant, and that's borrowed from other market versions of Kia's Mondeo segment Optima model. Even the most potent unit in the Stinger range, the 3.3-litre twin-turbo V6 TGDI petrol unit we're trying in this top 365bhp GTS variant, was primarily developed for their big US market Genesis G90 luxury saloon. It doesn't sound too promising, does it? Which makes it all the more pleasant to find the road-going reality in this car much better than the mechanical provenance of the underbonnet parts would suggest it might be, especially in this flagship GTS version. Now, yes, it is a pity that this top twin-turbo V6 doesn't get the fruity full-bore exhaust that's fitted to the American market models, but it's still an urgent-sounding thing and quite up to the task of propelling this sportier stinger along very quickly indeed. Use the provided launch control system and from rest you're fired up the road to 60 miles an hour in just 4.7 seconds en route to a 168 miles an hour maximum. That's quicker than anything BMW can serve up in a rival 4 Series Grand Coupe and on a par with much pricier performance segment big hitters like Audi's S5 Sportback and the Mercedes AMG C43. Does it feel quite that fast? Uh, well, in truth, no. Thank the slightly slothful feel of the standard eight-speed auto transmission for that, which isn't as quick and decisive in its changes as the much quicker-witted auto gearbox setups that are favoured by the Germans. Uh, there are paddle shifters provided, but there's no properly locked-out manual mode, so you can use them really aggressively. In short, Kia uh, really should have bought in an off-the-shelf ZF auto box, as, say, Jaguar would do. Still, once you adjust to that, there's lots to like here. The 3.3-litre engine has a lusty 510 newton meters of torque. It starts pulling from just 1,500 revs and really gets into its sweet spot between 3 and 4,000 RPM, clearing its throat with the aid of a mildly contrived audio system soundtrack uh, that broadcasts responses to your right foot if you switch into one of the sporty driving modes. As is now usual with setups of this kind, there are two dynamic settings on offer, Sport and Sport Plus. Although to use a setting of these, you'll need to be feeling a little brave. That's because Sport Plus restricts stability control assistance, which does mean it's quite easy to get the rear end squirming playfully around with a quick, deliberate jab of your right foot. That reminds you of the Stinger's proper old-school rear-wheel driven configuration, this being the first time Kia has propelled one of its cars from the back axle. Such a configuration isn't something you can take for granted in this segment. Uh, in fact, rivals like Audi's A5 Sportback and Volkswagen's Artyan both lack it, and they feel distinctly less involving as a result. The Korean brand does also offer four-wheel drive on this car in other countries, but doesn't feel there's a need for it here. Neither do we, actually. Instead, the brand has standardized a limited slip differential across the range for our market, and this in concert with a torque vectoring system, which uh, lightly breaks the inside front wheel at speed through tight corners, means that the Stinger is really quite adept at overcoming its rather portly 1.8 tonne body weight and hunting itself from bend to bend, should you be inclined to drive it in such a fashion. This being a GT though, there are going to be lots of times when at the wheel you won't want to do that, at which point the three other drive mode selections that you can make from this uh, centre console mounted dial will be more relevant. These include comfort and eco options, but you'll probably be more inclined most of the time to leave this car in the additional automatic smart setting in which guys the Stinger will continually adapt its responses to suit your driving style. In all its modes, the system's there to tweak throttle, steering feel and gear change timings, and in this top GTS model, it also has suspension feel too, thanks to the addition on this variant of electronic adaptive dampers. Now these are nice to have, but fortunately 
Unfortunately, they're not essential. The passive sprung setup used on lesser Stinger derivatives is exquisitely judged to give this car a fluid, authoritative feel over undulating surfaces, that, uh, and that's the sort of thing that every Gran Turismo really needs. Now we need to touch upon the other versions in the range, not least because these will be the ones that most real world buyers will be considering. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the likely buyer preference for the diesel, which we do think is a pity. As you'd expect, uh, this 2.2 litre unit does have plenty of pulling power, 440 newton metres of it, and the performance figures do look reasonable. Uh, 60 miles an hour from rest achieved in 7.3 seconds on the way to our 143 mph maximum. Unfortunately though, the refinement of that 2.2 litre CRDR unit does rather betray its SUV origins with levels of vibration and boominess that buyers in the premium sports saloon segment will be unused to. We direct you instead towards the surprisingly impressive 2 litre TGDI petrol power plant. Its 244 bhp output gives you 47 bhp more than you get in the diesel and much sprightlier feeling performance. Uh, the stats improved to 5.8 seconds en route to 140. 49 miles an hour. Predictably, that unit does lack the aural drama of this top V6, but like that model, it's superbly refined at cruising speeds and it feels as urgent and purposeful as you'd expect a relatively affordable GT model's power plant to be. So yes, most of what this car is about can be delivered by the entry-level petrol model, but if funds permit, it can be completed by this GTS variant. Either way, an out-of-the-ordinary experience awaits. trend for coupe style four and five door designs as an alternative to mid-size premium models in the volume part of the executive market is one that's gradually gathered pace over the last decade. Folk bored of just another BMW 3 Series, Audi A4 or Mercedes C-Class and who are open to the idea of something sleeker were first targeted in this segment by Volkswagen's stylized Passat CC Saloon back in 2005. Audi proved the same concept could work with five doors with their first generation a5 Sportback model of 2012 and two years later BMW tried much the same thing with its 4 Series Grand Coupe. Now this Stinger stays with that five door format but delivers it in a longer, lower form than is the case with comparably priced rivals. It's certainly a shape far more deserving of evocative Gran Turismo billing. German brands need to understand that you don't create a Gran Turismo simply by switching to a five-door body shape from an existing saloon and adding a rear spoiler. Now, designer Gregory Guillaume seems to have appreciated that better than his counterparts at Audi and BMW. And as a result, the Stinger is longer, lower, and quite differently proportioned from anything else in the segment. It's also a little bigger than its pricier A5 Sportback and four series Gran Coupe rivals. In fact, the wheelbase here is just 43 millimeters shorter than that of a huge Porsche Panamera. Now, Guillaume says that his favorite touch is this profile pinch just ahead of the rear wheel arch that gives a swept back silhouette its Coke bottle style shape, as though is possibly this fender vent just ahead of the front wheel arch uh, from which the two lower crease lines flow. And they separate rims that are 18 inches or on this GTS, 19 inches in size. So let's start with uh, what Monsieur Guillaume calls the sleek and sharky front end, uh, mounted between these complex dark chrome headlamp units that feature LED beams on this top model. There's this fresh interpretation of Kia's tiger nose grille uh, with dual studded metallic effect finishing. Primary cooling though is dealt with by this large lower grille and air intake, which is flanked by scoops that channel cooling out of the brakes. Meanwhile, further up, this long bonnet with its shiny black vents flows into a steeply raked windscreen with a castellated upper edge. It all provides plenty of overtaking presence with just the right blend of restraint, elegance, and sporting menace. Step around to the rear of the Stinger and you're also left in no doubt about this car's sporting intent, particularly on this top 3.3 litre V6 GTS version, which has these twin exhausts poking potently out of each side of the aggressively shaped rear diffuser. Uh, the LED rear lamps are connected by a reflector. Uh, they feature signature nighttime illumination and they curve round into the corners, framing a mid-level tailgate line emphasised by this rear spoiler that features a slight duck tail shape that reduces lift. 
Now, we had expected this aerodynamic appendage to automatically rise and fall at speed, as it does on some other Gran Turismo style models, but the designers wanted to save weight. And that's an understandable priority when you learn that uh, most versions of this car already tip the scales at over 1.8 tonnes. Um, as for what lies beneath the skin, well, it is essentially the chassis of Hyundai's Genesis Luxury Saloon, uh, the US market coupe version of which donates this GTS variant's 3.3 litre V6 engine too. Time to take a seat inside. Where a horrible chintzy welcoming chime sets a jarring note right from the outset, which is a pity because there's very little else to object to in a cabin that's far more luxurious and enveloping than you'd think the interior of a Kia ever could be. Uh, the faux leather soft touch trim centre console is broad, necessarily so, because the gearbox and drive shaft have to be packaged in beneath it, and you sit low on leather stitched figure-hugging sports seats that offer a host of adjustment and on this GTS variant feature inflatable side bolsters and they'll be ideal to hold you in place during enthusiastic cornering. Uh, there are definite hints of Porsche and Mercedes here. The stubby auto gear lever, the jet turbine style three chromed central round vents, but this cabin is much more than some kind of derivative Teutonic homage. It has its own sense of style and quality too, with cool metal surfaces, stitched leather trim panels and beautifully damp switch gear. Uh, the flat-bottomed three-spoke D-shaped steering wheel is perfectly positioned and it feels good to hold with just the right rim thickness and smart paddle shifters for the auto gearbox. Through it you view an instrument cluster that rather betrays the overextended gestation period of this design uh, by sticking with a purely analogue dial layout where rivals offer the option of virtual gauges on a fully digital configurable screen. Now we don't have an issue with this, there is a standard head-up display in compensation and the dials in the binnacle are clear and classily presented, plus they're usefully separated by a 7-inch Supervision cluster colour display that, as well as all the usual trip computer and settings functions, also gives you the option of selecting the G-Force and lap time displays that you'll need when you're returning this stinger to the Nürburgring Nordschleife racetrack where it was developed. I mean, if you buy this card, then at least once you really should. Yes, a few items have been carried over from lesser Kia models, but none of this shared componentry is really glaringly out of place on this more premium product. Uh, we happen to run a Kia Rio Super Mini with the same centre dash infotainment system, but were we not as familiar with this setup and were we coming to this car for the first time, we probably wouldn't comment on this 8-inch monitor's provenance. Uh, we might take issue with its functionality though. Uh, it's a touchscreen, which is fine, but it does lack the kind of separate controller down by the gear stick that makes the rival German premium brand media setups so much easier to use. Still, there's plenty here with sat-nav, voice control, uh, traffic messaging, smartphone mirroring and a very decent DAB audio system. Normally with nine crisply defined speakers, uh, this top GTS model does better though with a thumping 15-speaker Harman Kardon setup. In addition, using the Kia Connected Services with TomTom Tom package, uh, you can check up on jams, the weather, safety camera locations and local information such as petrol stations and places to visit. Enough on the front, what's it like in the rear? Uh, now the cars that this thing is priced against aren't especially generous when it comes to meeting the spatial needs of backseat folk. This Kia though comes from different stock with a wheelbase around 100 millimeters longer than say that of a rival BMW 4 Series Grand Tourer. It's a substantial 190 millimeters longer than that car and also around 100 millimeters longer than a competing Audi A5 Sportback too. So will all that extra length allow it to deliver something better back here. Well, that low-slung roof line sows a few initial doubts on that score, but the door opens wide to reveal an invitingly Gran Turismo-like rear cabin. With plenty of room for legs, knees and shoulders, rather surprising there's a even reasonable headroom, 939 millimetres of it to be exact. Now what's on offer here can't match the palatial standards of a rival Volkswagen Arteon, but it certainly outclasses those competitors from Audi and BMW. And if you take a seat in a rival Jaguar XE after trying one of these, 
well, you're going to feel like you're in a super mini. Inevitably, of course, it's not in any way suited to the carriage of three adults. Gran Turismo's never are. Uh, the prominently high centre transmission tunnel mitigates against that, although it does help to some extent to replicate the cocooning, hunkered down feeling that you get up front. It's all beautifully finished too, with brushed aluminium trim, stitched leather and intricate speaker grills decorating the doors, while the central area is punctuated by these two lovely chromed vents. Overhead reading lights are missing and the door bins are tiny, but you do get 12 volt and USB points, seat back nets and an armrest with twin cup holders. So finally, let's take a look in the boot. Uh, avoid entry level trim and you get this powered tailgate. And once it raises, a uh, shallow but quite spacious looking 406 litre cargo air is revealed. Now, despite this thing's length, that capacity figure is relatively mean by class standards. Both Audi's A5 Sportback and BMW's 4 Series Grand Tourer are able to deliver 480 litres. Still, it's likely to be suitable for the needs of most owners and it's easily sufficient for a couple of large suitcases, although you will have to lift them over quite a high sill here. Uh, we do have more of an issue with the fact that Kia hasn't thought to include provision for pushing longer items through into the cabin, either via a ski hatch or through a 40-20-40 rear backrest split. That's an important omission. Uh, there's not much else to take issue with though, unless you notice the lack of a 12 volt socket. And like us, you rue the fact that so many manufacturers in this segment now see no reason to provide buyers with any sort of spare wheel. At least in this case, that's freed up room for this segregated storage area underneath the boot floor. Uh, securing rings let you lash more delicate items in place. If you need more capacity, you can of course uh, drop down the 60-40 uh, split seat backs. Uh, the space then freed up isn't completely flat, but it is quite large, 1114 litres in total capacity. It must have been difficult for Kia to know how to price this car. Uh, Size-wise, it sits between the mid-sized and full-sized premium executive segments, or to put it another way, between BMW 3 Series and 5 Series models, if that makes more sense. It's a hatch, of course, those models are saloons, and that once would have been preferable for company customers. Um, in recent years, though, many of them have been uh, persuaded to pay more for stylized hatchback versions of these cars, and that's typically in the mid-level executive class by the BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe and the Audi A5 Sportback, and in the full-size segment by BMW's 6 Series Grand Turismo and by Audi's A7 Sportback. Again, the positioning with this Korean contender is between these two classes in terms of size. But not, of course, in terms of price. Aware that its brand equity can only be pushed so far, Kia has costed this Stinger just below premium segment mid-sized 3 Series class models, and that means an asking figure for the least expensive 2-litre petrol turbo version of this car of around £32,000. Now, that amount gets you entry-level GT line spec, which for a £1,600 premium also comes with the 2.2 litre CRDI diesel engine that it's predicted that over 40% of Stinger bars will want. If you are happy for the price to crest £35,000, then you'll be interested to know with both those engines, there's a plusher GT line S trim level that's offered at a £3,500 premium. Beyond that, there's only the flagship 3.3 litre TGDI V6 petrol variant we're trying here, which comes only in a single fully loaded GTS spec and requires a £41,000 budget for ownership. All variants use an eight-speed auto gearbox and they all drive through the rear wheels. Kia for the time being deciding against the all-wheel drive platform that it offers in other markets. So how does that value proposition stack up? Well, Kia certainly seems on solid ground with the two litre petrol entry level Stinger variant. Think in terms of needing to pay six to seven thousand pounds more for directly comparable rivals like a BMW 430i M Sport or an Audi A5 Sportback two litre TFSI Sport. 
even slightly less mainstream stylized four to five seat models in this category struggle value wise when they're asked to match the potent performance and price proposition of that two litre TGDI Stinger. So we're thinking here of an Alfa Romeo Giulia two litre turbo petrol 280 bhp Veloce, uh, perhaps also Jaguars XC in two litre 300 PS R Sport form and the two litre TSI 280 PS version of Volkswagen's Artian. All three cars are priced at over £38,000. The diesel Stinger proposition isn't quite as strong as perhaps you might expect given that Kia's 197bhp 2.2 litre CRDI unit is one of the brand's older engines. Uh, the £34,000 price point that this variant sits at is what's also required for comparable sportily trimmed diesel versions of the Alfa Romeo Giulia, Jaguar's XE and Volkswagen's Artian models that just mentioned. Uh, you could though easily pay around £3,000 more than that for a sport Sportily trimmed auto versions of sector diesel big hitters like say the BMW 420D Grand Coupe or the Audi A5 Sportback 2 litre TDI 190 PS. As for this flagship 3.3 litre TGDI V6 GTS model, well, a directly comparable BMW 440i Grand Coupe M Sport will cost you about £4,000 more and is fractionally slower off the mark. Otherwise, you're going to need to think about spending between seven and £8,000 more on cars like Audi's S5 Sportback and the Mercedes AMG C43 if you're going to properly match the proposition on offer here. Bear in mind that nearly all the rivals just mentioned are significantly more more cramped than this one is in the back seat. If having considered all of those, you conclude that it is a stinger you really want, then you're probably going to expect this Kia to be better equipped than its premium rivals. And sure enough, uh, even base GT line trim gives you plenty of kit. Uh, so as well as the non-negotiable drive orientated features that all variants must have, uh, a limited slip differential for extra cornering traction and a drive mode select driving setting system that allows you to tweak the throttle response, the gear change timings and the steering feel. Uh, this level in the range delivers you plenty else. Uh, 18 inch alloy wheels, keyless entry, projection headlights with daytime running illumination, tinted glass, power folding heated mirrors, an alarm and LED rear lamps. Plus there's smart cruise control with a limiter that when it's activated prevents you from straying above the maximum permissible limit. Inside the seats will be upholstered in your choice of black, grey or red leather and those at the front are heated. They come with four-way electrical adjustment and they feature memory positioning. Uh, power movement for the steering column helps to further fine-tune the driving position and to better place you not only to view the 7-inch colour supervision cluster in the instrument binnacle but also the standard head-up display which will beam key information onto the bottom of the windscreen. Uh, dual zone climate control, a heated steering wheel, alloy pedals, a reversing camera, a trip computer and lovely trimming including a suede style headliner also come included as does a full house infotainment system operated via an 8-inch center dash screen that gives you access to navigation, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, Bluetooth with music streaming and a 9-speaker DAB audio system. There's also the TomTom powered Kia Connected Services package that gives you traffic, weather and local search information. The brand expects though that most Stinger buyers will find the extra to graduate up to mid-range GT Line S trim which does add some important extra niceties, a large sunroof for example and a powered tailgate. Plus inside at this level you'll get a 360 degree around view monitor, cooled ventilated front seats, heated rear upholstery, a wireless smartphone charger and a thumping 15 speaker Harman Kardon premium sound system with a subwoofer and quantum logic surround sound. All of this stuff is also fitted of course to the flagship Stinger model, the 3.3 litre V6 GTS variant that we're trying here. Now in addition though, this top model seeks to set itself apart, hence the 19 inch alloy wheels with their red Brembo brake calipers and this version's five way adjustable electronic adaptive dampers that allow you to fine tune the driving experience to the conditions. Inside in a GTS, softer Nappa leather covers the seats and the driver is treated to adjustable side bolsters for added support.
And options. Well, rather refreshingly, unlike its premium segment rivals, Kia doesn't go big on trying to get you to spend thousands more to spec your car just as you want it. The brand prefers instead uh, that its customers move up a trim grade if they're seeking greater luxury. In fact, the only significant extra cost box you can tick in specifying your Stinger is that for upgraded premium paint. We've got ceramic grey here. On to safety, and the story is similarly comprehensive here. The expected new tech camera drum features are present and correct, primarily autonomous emergency braking. That's one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential accident hazards. Uh, if one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Uh, there's also driver attention warning, that'll monitor your driving reactions for drowsiness, high beam assist, now that will automatically dip the headlights for you at night, and lane keep assist, which can sense if you veer over the lane delineating lines at highway speeds and then gently steer you back to where you should be. More familiar safety features include twin front side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag, Isofix child seat fastenings, an active bonnet for pedestrian protection, a tyre pressure monitoring system, and hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Plus, of course, there's all the usual electronic assistance for traction and ABS braking with emergency stop signalling that flashes the hazard lights to warn following motorists should you need to make a panic stop. Plus, as well as ESC, electronic stability control, there's also a VSM, vehicle stability management system, which corrects potential skids without any driver intervention. Uh, the stability system also features a useful interim sport style setting, which allows you a bit of extra leeway before the electronics cut in, if you want to throw your stinger around a bit. Those buyers who've avoided entry level trim also get another key camera driven feature, blind spot detection with rear cross traffic alert. Now the blind spot bit is there to warn you if on the move you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Uh, the rear cross traffic alert element meanwhile uses the same camera to warn you of oncoming traffic uh, when you're reversing out of a space. If there's one area of world-class car design that Kia and its Korean ownership conglomerate has yet to crack, then it's probably that of running cost efficiency. As other brands have proved, there's no real secret to how you get this right. It's about cutting-edge engine design plus lightweight chassis and bodywork technology. You then make that to the electronic efficiency measures that are now common in most modern cars, and you find yourself able to make really dramatic differences to fuel and CO2 figures. Especially when it comes to premium segment luxury models that previously would have struggled in this regard. Kia will one day get all of this sorted right across its model range. One glance at the company's hybrid and electric models is enough to tell you that it has the technology and the willpower to do that. That this hasn't happened yet is very evident from a glance at the stats of the various Stinger models, which in very rough terms deliver running cost efficiency figures that are around 20% behind those that you'd enjoy in a comparably powerful European rival. That's despite the provision of the company's intelligent stop-go engine stop-start system on all variants. A lot of this is down to weight, and in turn, a lot of that is down to the rather overextended gestation period of this design. Uh, the GT concept model of 2011 that today's Stinger is based on was conceived some time before current developments in lightweight chassis technology began to take effect. In fact, none of that was really necessary for the K900 luxury saloon that was first to use the model platform provided here, but it is important in the GT segment that the Stinger finds itself competing in now. This Kia is around 150 kilos heavier than a rival BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe and around 300 kilos heavier than a comparable Audi A5 Sportback. That's a massive difference and it has to show up in the stats, and indeed it does. Uh, the best returns in the Stinger range are of course provided by the 2.2 litre CRDI diesel, which manages a combined consumption figure of 50.4 mpg and emits 147 grams per kilometre of carbon dioxide. Switch to the 2 litre TGDI petrol model that we'd recommend 
recommend, and those figures fall to 35.8 mpg and 181 grams per kilometer. Uh, with the 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 petrol GTS flagship variant we're trying here, the returns are 28.5 mpg and 225 grams per kilometer. Before you despair of getting the prospect of Stinger motoring by your company accountant though, do bear in mind that much of this shortfall can be countered by this Kia's significantly lower asking price. Even the predicted residuals aren't too bad, bearing in mind that uh, there are restricted levels of brand equity here. Industry experts Cat reckon that after three years and 60,000 miles, your Stinger will still be worth between 36 and 39 percent of what you originally paid for it. To give you some perspective, that is about the same as you get from a top BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe, and only a few percentage points off the class leader in this regard, Audi's A5 Sportback. Of course, these are only predictions, and with a fashion conscious product of this kind, uh, the outlook can always be a touch uncertain. Nevertheless, if only on sheer rarity value, this Stinger can be expected to doggedly hold on to its value in a way that no previous Kia model ever has. You might do a double take when it comes to the service intervals though, uh, at least on the petrol variants anyway. Uh, they require scheduled maintenance halts as frequently as every six months or 6,000 miles, whichever comes around soonest. It is a bit better with the CRDI diesel version where garage appointments are needed every year or 10,000 miles. Kia says that it will enable buyers to keep the cost of this in check with a range of available prepaid Care 3 servicing packages that you can sign up for at point of purchase. Now these can take care of the cost of either the first three or the first five dealer visits. On the plus side, this Kia, like the brand's other models, gets the company's much trumpeted seven-year, 100,000-mile warranty. It's a package which, like the Care 3 servicing packages, is transferable to future owners. However, it's worth pointing out that the warranty only offers unlimited mileage for the first three years that you own the car. Thereafter, you'll have a 100,000-mile restriction. If in future the car is sold through a Kia used approved dealership when it's less than 18 months old or with less than 18,000 miles on the clock, the warranty will be topped up to match that of a new model. And throughout you'll be covered by Kia Assist Breakdown Cover 2. You'll also want to know whether the cost of insurance is likely to be prohibitive with a desirable, performance-orientated, fashionable GT like this one. The answer is, well, no, not really. The base petrol 2-litre TGDI variant is rated at Group 34 in entry-level GT line trim or Group 36 in mid-level GT line S guys. Uh, for the 2.2-litre CRDI diesel, it'll be Group 32 for GT line spec and Group 34 the GT line S model. For this potent V6 GTS, you're looking at a Group 41 ranking, which is exactly the same as that of an Audi S5. It's probably evident by now that we like this thing very much. It's certainly not the kind of car you would have expected from this ambitious Korean brand, but in many ways, it's the sort of model only Kia could have made. The styling is unconstrained by the need to reference other premium designs in the brand's portfolio because, for the time being at least, there aren't any. In the same way, the drive dynamics have been individually judged, giving this car a fluid, rewarding feel that fits perfectly with its Gran Turismo billing. Once you've tried it, you'll feel a hint of compromise in most European rivals. Designer Grigory Guillaume reckons the Stinger will signal a paradigm shift in the way that customers perceive the brand, and that could well be true. It certainly represents a brave move on Kia's part, from its cartoonish name to the swagger in its styling to its defiantly old-school European-style rear-driven platform. But no matter how good it is, executive buyers will have to get past that badge on the boot lid. The Koreans are right to think that even a couple of years ago, the company's market positioning couldn't have sustained a car like this. It'll be interesting to see if it can now. The majority of folk who'll think not won't even bother to look at this contender in the first place. And the few that do will return to their usual BMW, Audi, Mercedes or Jaguar, justifying the status quo by pointing out that this Kia's efficiency figures aren't of top table quality, residual returns may be questionable, uh, boot space could be bigger, and that a few of its fixtures and fittings are borrowed from lower order models. 
All of that is true, but none of it ought to be significant if this time around you want to make a more dynamic, individual, mid-sized executive segment choice. Now, I have a feeling that the sweet spot in the range might lie with a temptingly priced 2-litre petrol model rather than this V6 GTS variant, but either way, you'll get yourself an automobile that fundamentally feels like it's been created by people who like cars a lot. That is a rarity in today's market, and it deserves your attention.